Good Tuesday evening to you. This is the Preterist Power Hour uh, ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network. And uh, again, it's a privilege to be here for obviously a special hour as we're usually live at 11 a.m. Uh, here we are 7 p.m. We have a special guest with us tonight, Dr. Lynn Hiles. And I look forward to a, a great discussion, getting to know him. And of course, diving into a bit of theology, uh, learning a bit about uh, the term preterist and uh, all that and more. So uh, I'm excited for our evening. Edward, good evening to you, brother. Thank you for uh, being here with me. Uh, real quickly, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Mike Miano. I'm the pastor here at Blue Point Bible Church in Blue Point, New York, as well as the director of the Power of Preterism Network. And you can learn more about the Power of Preterism Network and what we endeavor to see happen within the preterist community, if you'd like to call it that, um, by visiting powerofpreterism.com. And a host of resources are available for you over there. Uh, that's what I have to say, Edward. I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself. And if you don't mind, lead us in a word of prayer. Sure. My name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, also a board member of the Power of Preterism Network. Uh, now I would like to lead us in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, please go before us. Give doc Dr. Ben Hiles clarity of thought that what he will present will be with clarity of thought and proper focus. You know, uh, also for Pastor Michael, the same, and grant me the same as well. <laughs> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for those listeners. Uh, bless them that they may be empowered at this hour as well as ourselves, and um, that it will provoke all of us to uh, conversation on these matters and develop in fellowship with one another, you know, which is the goal. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. And as you know, today is Testimony Tuesday. So it's important for us to mark out a testimonial thought every Tuesday. Again, I believe uh, if we could be strategic with our week, uh, Missional Monday, Testimony Tuesday, Wisdom Wednesday, get into the books of wisdom there. Uh, I think it can benefit us greatly. So uh, Edward, for myself, I'll share mine. And if you don't mind, I'd be, I'd be interested to hear what you might have to say for a Testimony Tuesday. Uh, however, for me, what I'd like to just praise God for is it actually uh, builds upon your prayer, uh, the body of believers, you, you know, and the insight that we get from the different minds and hearts that have come together to be this glorified body of Christ. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just so benefited by it. As you know, I'm preparing for a upcoming presentation at a conference in Tennessee. And it's been different minds and different thoughts that have really helped me put together my presentation, you know, obviously leaning on the scriptures and studying the scriptures, but listening to others and actually hearing their concerns, hearing their questions, hearing, you know, maybe the way that they see it rather than, uh, you know, obviously for forcing the way that I see it in the conversation and allowing that to be beneficial to me uh, in my, my study. Uh, again, I'm just praising God for that. And I know that that is a, a God ordained thing. That is what God wants. Uh, he wants his people to come together and he wants us to, you know, discern things together and, and rightly endeavor to rightly divide together. So, uh, just praising God for the members of the body, if you will. And uh, that's my testimony Tuesday, brother. Uh, how about you? You got anything you want to share with us? Sure. Well, dealing with what you had just described, you know, I'm grateful and thankful to have Dr. Lynn Howes on with us uh, this evening because, you know, uh, we definitely grow by uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. And like that, like um, that gentleman that you had mentioned that said, we don't sit on the shoulders resting, doing nothing. We stand being active, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. And right. I believe uh, Dr. Lynn Hiles, how he rubbed shoulders with other giants as well as, as himself and having this opportunity, meeting all of these giants that I consider, you know, is, is a wonderful experience. And it's, it's just been such a blessing and answered prayer because when I first came to um, Blue Point Bible Church, you know, seeing all of these people spoken of and stuff of that nature uh, for preterists, and the knowledge in which they've had to share, you know, the manifold wisdom of God, you know, uh, I, I wanted to meet these people. I wanted to, you know, uh, get to at least, you know, see the image of them, you know, and I've had that opportunity and it's just been a blessing. Amen, brother. And I appreciate your, your diligence, your desire and your consistency in being here. So uh, praise God for that. Now, again, I want to move into bringing Lynn Hiles on the program and kind of get into things. But before I do that, I do want to let everyone know uh, you can learn more about what we're doing here at the Preterist Power Hour. We provide a blog at powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. It's a free blog site. Uh, go ahead and visit that. Uh, if you go to powerofpreterism.com, it'll lead you there. 
And the reason why is we provide outlines to each of our Preterist Power Hours. So following this discussion tonight, you'll be able to gain the access to the podcast that we have, as well as a host of resources that will most likely be mentioned during this evening's session. So we wanna encourage you to go back and visit that. Uh, Edward and I have uh, been studying, I joked with Lynn before we uh, came on live that, you know, uh, I've been watching his his messages for like four days, so I feel like I know him already, uh, you know, going through resources and kind of studying around. Uh, and Edward, I know I've shared some of those resources with you as well, so uh, I'm sure you even feel as though you might know him a bit more than uh, than we do, because here we were listening to him kind of feeling like we were sitting there in the congregation and uh, yeah. learning from him. So, uh, you know, I first heard of Lynn Hiles actually back in 2015. I did a little bit of research trying to find out when did I first start noting this name. And I remember, I don't remember how or why, I don't know if he spoke at a conference or uh, maybe he'll share with us uh, maybe where I may have heard from him uh, or heard of him, uh, but I was stirred enough to actually reach out to him. And I went into my messages there and I noticed back in 2015, I even welcomed him uh, to the possibility of speaking at our annual Bible conference here at the Blue Point Bible Church back in 2015. Uh, matter of fact, since then, we've had Glenn Hill visit with us here at the Blue Point Bible Church a couple times, and he's, you know, mentioned that Lynn Hiles was very uh, a blessing and, and was continuing to be a blessing within uh, the fulfilled community. So uh, that being said, I, I'm very excited to bring him onto our program tonight. Matter of fact, another thing was as I went through my Facebook, I just put in Lynn Hiles in Facebook, and sure enough, I've been posting quotes of his since 2016 uh, all over my Facebook, you know, one going back to 2016 that I believe is very beneficial for us to consider. Does what you believe work in your life, your family, and your local church? A great deal of the wild stuff I read on Facebook is coming from sources who have no connection with a local body. Dealing with real life issues will, issues will adjust your theology beyond a theory. And Edward, you know, that's something we've leaned in on very much where we believe that the local body is the, the very source of life. Uh, it's the way that you engage the kingdom of God. And uh, you know that I was recently uh, featured in the local newspaper, matter of fact, for an article that talked about the efficacy of the local church uh, in our community. So when I read that quote, I was just very encouraged. And I'll just, uh, I have a whole bunch here, but I'll read the most recent one that I cited that I thought was very encouraging. And obviously, has a lot to do with why we're here on the Preterist Power Hour. This was uh, in March, 2022. Uh, for your information, the Bible does not talk about the end of the world. The Greek word used in most of the end of the world scriptures is age. Most translations now translate it correctly. The end of the age was the old covenant age. The tr that transition happened in the first century. The end is not cosmic, it was covenantal. The audience it was written to was that generation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul said they were the ones upon whom the ends of the ages had come. So again, beautifully expressed. Uh, Dr. Lin, thank you very much for being willing to join with us tonight. Thank you for those great thoughts and your contributions. We look forward to learning a bit more tonight as uh, we welcome you to the program and have you share some thoughts with us. Thank you so much for having me on the program. I, I guess you probably want me to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I, this is uh, that you guys are kind of new to me. I've read some of your posts as well. Glenn Hill, of course, is a friend of mine, and John Noe are friends of mine. And uh, but Glenn and I probably go back. That may have been how you heard about me the first time. Maybe you've been through Glenn. But um, uh, you know, I my background basically was I grew up classical Pentecost and began to question a whole lot of stuff that just didn't make sense when I would read it. And even as a young man, I, I you know, I, I would, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'll be 65 this year, but when I was 16, I began to uh, ask questions. And I thought, you know, when uh, like Matthew 24, like we just talked about was like, uh, you know, I thought he's not writing to me, he's writing that to this generation. And I would go ask, you know, some of the leaders and they'd say, now be careful now you're getting deceived. And I said, well, if I'm getting deceived, tell me where I'm getting deceived at. But what I discovered was in respect to them, they didn't know themselves. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times uh, people believe what they believe because they've never heard that there was an alternative. But to me, when, uh, when I started looking for answers, that's clear back in the early seventies. And I've never been a rapture preacher per se, but I've never, of course, I'm an ongoing 
you know, work of the spirit myself, because I'm, I'm still a student. I'm always a student, even before I'm a teacher. And there are still things that I'm not settled on yet. And, you know, that's why I, I told you before we came on, you know, one of the I think one of the reasons I've been successful in the audience that I have is that I'm not trying to win an argument. I'm, I'm just trying to, uh, you know, dialogue with people and listen to what they have to say. And then when even when I teach seminars, I always say things like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll report you decide. And uh, what happened to me was the preponderance of evidence as I started looking into the scripture just became so overwhelmingly convincing that many of these scriptures were not talking about future things. I and mean, when you go there with this mindset that it is, you already have blinders on. But once you start to see this, I tell people a lot, a lot of times, once you see this, you can't unsee it. And it opens so many scriptures to me. I mean, when you start, to, I, I would think one of the greatest keys to understanding the Bible was my understanding of fulfilled eschatology, because it puts everything in its proper context and its proper place, and then it makes sense there. And so, you know, uh, like I said, I kind of grew up in classical Pentecost, so I'm still kind of charismatic, and I still embrace, you know, some of that. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that at least that's my, my bent. I think it's kind of uh, amazing that this particular uh, uh, theology reaches across the denominational barriers, and uh, there are people in every camp, I think, that at least embrace pieces of fulfilled theology or preterism, however you want to, uh, you know, look at it. Of course, there are different degrees of it, but uh, at least for me, uh, it was it was a it it, it was to me, uh, especially at this particular season, the hope that it puts in your heart and and the removal of fear of stuff that that continually seems to perpetuate our, you know, Facebook pages and uh, television uh, waves and all of that, you know, have, uh, you know, kind of made people fearful. And just, uh, I don't know how much time you want me to take, but I, I've been in full-time traveling ministry for 43 years. This is my 43rd year, full-time traveling ministry. I've been on national television for 12 years now. We, uh, we air on Impact Network on Mondays at 4 p.m. on almost every outlet there is. We, uh, we're on Direct, on Dish Network, we're on Comcast, I meant Spectrum, all kinds of, you just have to check your cable to see, but we're on Impact and, and of course all over the internet with YouTube. And then of course Impact gives us a bonus run uh, at least once a week, but I don't know what time that is. We were on several networks at, at once, uh, but we at this point we're just doing the one but uh, that's kind of my history. And, you know, we kind of I kind of grew up looking for answers and it was so hard. I'm so thankful for places like this, websites like you guys have where people can go and look, because when I was looking for answers, I didn't know there was another view. I mean, I, I, I literally dug a lot of this stuff out. I didn't even know I, I didn't even know I was a preterist until somebody asked me one day. They said, are you a preterist? I said, well, that sounds like pervert to me. I don't think I'm one of them, you know. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, you know, what happened was, is I began to realize, well, there's a whole school of thought here. And then I found out there were several denominations that embraced this. And then I started coming across materials that were answers to me. I think one of the great uh, books for me uh, uh, that helped me a great deal was the Parousia or the Perusia, however you pronounce it, by J. Russell Stewart was probably one of the most helpful volumes when I was younger to come across, and I still probably am as close to what he believes as anybody, and then of course, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've come across all kinds of different materials since then and fed on them, study them, look at them, some of it I, I you know, just chew on it a little while and and see you know if it gels with my spirit or not but, uh you know that's kind of been the, the the deal and you know as i was telling you before we came on we started sharing some of this on national television and when i did i thought this probably if i do this on national television this will be i'll be signing my death warrant so to speak but amazingly the response levels went out the roof people are looking for hope and they're looking for answers and uh, our response levels went out the roof. And then I started meeting in private with leaders. And I thought the first one I did a few years ago, probably 2016, uh, I invited leaders only. And I told my son, I said, this is really on my heart to do. Uh, my son is the executive producer for our TV stuff. And I said, I, I, I know it's short notice, but I said, I got to do this. I just got to pick a spot and do it. If I have 15, I'll think this is hugely successful. 
But the first meeting I had had 150 leaders and they were high profile leaders. And uh, so then I met several times. And then last year in, in October, we decided to do this in Birmingham, hosted by two churches. And we opened it to not only leaders, but to people as well. And that was hugely successful. And that's that's some of the videos that John Noe is running right now on his YouTube channel. So that's kind of my story. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I've grown up around, you know, as I, I as I've uh, progressed in my revelation from the days of uh, Pentecost. And like I said, I still embrace that experience, but I found it with a whole lot of stuff that I had to, uh, you know, kind of lay aside and, uh, you know, begin to hear the gospel of the kingdom, but it was still kind of, uh, you know, sketchy as to what that meant to some. And uh, this put the meat on the bones for me. And it, it really began to and I've written several books since then, you know, that help people, I think, make the transition, because I really believe that we are probably in one of the greatest reformations right now of human history. And I think that there is an appetite for people looking for something that has some hope in it. They are tired of the sky is falling. They're tired of, uh, you know, the doom and despair and just the possibility that uh, the outcome of this thing might be victorious and hopeful, I think, really resonates with people. So. I don't know how much you want me to talk, but I'll just kind of give it back to you and see, you know, if you want me to go on with some of that or what, what, what you're looking. All right. But well, actually, I, I did have a couple of questions uh, quickly. If I can ask you, um, so how did you come to the faith in general? I know you said you, you grew up kind of in the charismatic church. Uh, what was that experience? Well, well how, you, for me, I, I started, uh, you know, in my teenage years, I would come across scriptures like this generation will not pass away till these things are fulfilled. And, you know, uh, uh, these things are about to shortly come to pass. And I would, I, I would think this, the, he's not talking to me here. Hmm. He's talking to these people, but nobody could explain that to me. So you probably don't even know some of these names. But in my early days, there was a guy named Bill Britton, uh, who has long passed. But Bill Britton was out of Springfield, Missouri. And at the time, he had been kind of kicked out, I think, if I'm not mistaken, of the of, of the assemblies of God, I, I probably shouldn't say denominations because I don't, I try not to be, I'm not fighting anybody, you right. know, but anyway, uh, you know, I came across uh, a, 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 an article he wrote and it was, uh, it, it started putting me on the trail. And then uh, my father-in-law who has been uh, passed away about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago uh, was what I would call kind of a mild kingdom preacher. He wasn't kind of like a he was a little more progressive than most people that were around. And then I came across a guy named Jay Preston E.B. Jay Preston E.B. then uh, passed away this year, but uh, he was more of an idealist. So I kind of got an idealist view of the book of Revelation. And uh, so I preached a lot of that because I could see the idealist. But in the midst of it, then I really, I guess, uh, piece by piece, stuff started coming to me. And then I kind of got on the trail of, uh, I came across another book that was on the historical, the historicness, you know, look, view of Revelation. And what it did was said, well, a lot of that happened in the first century, but the latter part was, you know, Rome and the Catholic Church and some of that. And then uh, I, I looked at that, but but that that book or some of that opened to me the idea that, wait a minute, a lot of the, here's some guys that believe some of this is fulfilled. And then, um, you know, I, I came across uh, writers like Gary DeMar, and uh, I believe it was uh, uh, John Noe, some of his books early on. And uh, uh, I think, like I said, uh, The Perusia, uh, Parousia, however you all say it, by J. Russell Stewart. I, I started noticing a lot of the writers were, were uh, quoting this guy. So mm -hmm. I thought, I'm going to see if I can find this book. And I found that book, and it's probably the best in one volume of anything I've ever read. It's very difficult reading, it's a thick book, but it's, uh, it, and then I've discovered this guy wrote this probably in the 1800s. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is not something new. And then I, I found out that the history of it is, it, it, go, it proceeds, and then I begin to realize, wait a minute, it's, even this whole dispensational rapture thing was only a couple hundred years old. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, as you start, you know, if you've been in church any length of time in your life, you have heard them say, Jesus is coming soon and any minute now. And after 50, 60 years of nothing happening, mm -hmm. you start thinking either, you know, either somebody's wrong here or there's another way to look at this. 
And I know I've only been, you know, on this planet for 60 some years, but the reality of it is, is they've been crying, the sky's falling for a long time. And I really think that it has crippled the church in its destiny and its purpose in the earth. And, uh, you know, uh, I said, I think, I, forget, I think in that Birmingham conference, I said, if you think this ship is sinking, you're not going to polish the brass on a sinking ship. But if you believe we've got a future, you're going to begin to engage in what I believe the church is supposed to do. And I'm like you, I am very, very passionate about local church. I want to say that very clearly, because one of the things we do more than anything else with national television is we plug people into local churches all over the world. Uh, and uh, because I strongly believe in the local church and I believe it is very vital and I believe it is important. I'm a part of a local church, even though my ministry is way bigger uh, on, an, on an international level than my local church. But I strongly believe in the local church. I believe in being a part of, of something bigger than myself and the church in and whole. And I think, like you said, I think there's really been among, you know, see, not just among preterists. But usually what happens is once you start to see, for me, the, the real thing, the real powerful point to me was not just the fact that a lot of these eschatological things were fulfilled in the first century. That's very powerfully important. But the key component to me was when I realized it was the last days of a covenant and not the last days of a cosmic collapse, mm. that's a game changer. Because I realized, wait a minute, we have been, we're preaching the wrong covenant. We're preaching the law. We're preaching for a, a lot of old covenant ideas. And when I really saw that, it started to really catapult me into, I was already preaching grace, but it catapulted me into realizing, you know, that uh, this, this, this new covenant thing has got to be really developed and not with mixture. And, but what happens is then, then the grace camp kind of got to the point where they were like, not believing in local church or, you know, not believing in, you know, uh, supporting the local church. And I just, you know, said, you know, hey, I'll just cut through all the doctrinal argument. What you don't support goes away. And if you don't support your baseball team, it goes away. If you don't support your PTA, it goes away. If you don't support your local church, it goes away. But the local church to me has been so valuable to me personally and to my family. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, my great grandmother was serving Jesus. My grandmother serving Jesus. My dad was the founding pastor here. And my mom and dad pastored uh, where I attend. My sister and her husband are now the senior pastors where I attend. But I travel all the time. I preach someplace different in the world every week. So that's that's kind of, you know, my my passion about it is, again, not so much arguing over, you know, there's a lot of the details that I, I've noticed people want to fight about all these little details that to me are like, I don't know if it's that important to fight over. If we can get to the point where we realize we're so enamored, I think sometimes with a coming Jesus, we forget about the one that's already in the room. And, I, you know, when you realize Jesus is already here, what are you going to do with him? You know, and you start to realize that, uh, you know, there's there's a, there is a purpose in the earth. All of a sudden you get your purpose back. When you realize that the world's not going to collapse and it's not going to end in what we thought was this great tribulation and and uh, you know bombs bursting in air and people flying through the sky, but we start realizing, listen, we we were here for a purpose, and you start to realize that some of the dreams that our young people have had are truly God dreams, and we've stole their dreams and wonder why they've left the local church because we told them they didn't have a future. But when you start to give them back their future and their dreams, they begin to realize, wait a minute, Christianity, true Christianity does not take my life. It gives me life and that more abundant. And that to me is my passion is not how many people know my name or how many TV programs I do or how many books I've written. What, what, what really floats my boat is knowing that I have blazed a trail for my children and my grandchildren to give them back their future. And so, you know, I have a daughter-in-law who's a doctor, one who is a chiropractor, and all, both of them, my son's a pastor, and my youngest son is a, an executive producer for a TV program. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, our family has realized that the dreams God put in them, that they, have the, they had the time to go to school and equip themselves for, for medicine or for chiropractic or so, you know, to, you could serve God in a whole lot of different ways. 
right. in my opinion, not just in the local church or in a, uh, you know, uh, maybe a song leader or whatever, a missionary. And that's what we used to think growing up as being a preacher or a missionary or song leader. And then, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, there's a whole lot of people that uh, were not really called to the ministry that that, that uh, just thought there was no you know, future. You know, they told me in the 70s, uh, uh, they said, you, you don't need an education. You'll never see the end of the 70s. Jesus will be be back. But here we are, you know, and uh, they're crying. The sky's falling again. But I think really that we are in a season where some of this stuff is going to make its last gasp, because when it don't happen like they say it's going to happen. People are tired, and now there's information. There's information out there uh, where they can get a hold of it and say, wait a minute, there may be another alternative to this. And to me, just the thought that I could possibly be right, that this thing doesn't have to end in catastrophe, but God really wins, and that we do have a future as a result of what was fulfilled, that a whole lot of what we thought of hell on earth coming is not coming at all. Uh, I, that's not to say that there's not some very real problems in our world, but what happens is we start to realize that the local church and the church is, in fact, the answer for it. And instead of trying to escape it, we must engage it and change our world around us. And so I think that's really been my call and my destiny. You know, and that's, I've, you know, like I've given my life to it. All, the, all my eggs are in this basket, so to speak. <laughs> You know, uh, one thing I have to say about the local church is I know a lot of times the world looks at the church as if that's what makes us feel as though we're right. For me, the benefit of the local church is actually that's where I oftentimes find out I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, it's that, you know, that community that helps me uh, build me up and rebuke me and correct, correct me and guide me. So that being said, you know, I wanted to uh, go back to something you had said about, uh, you know, the way that people come to understand fulfillment. I'm sure you've heard this. Uh, there's a variety of testimonies, you know, people come from all different angles. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure we've all found ourselves talking to somebody in, about any topic and you'll say, that's what you think about. That's what you're thinking about. And, you know, when it comes to the Bible, I don't think it's any different. I think people pick up certain details that they find to be important. And what ends up happening is what, what I think is beautiful is people have come in from all these different uh, on ramps, if you will. Uh, into fulfillment uh, in so many different ways. We hear it again and again, where people's testimonies are. I was not even familiar with a phrase called preterism, uh, you know, and then I, when I came to see these things in scripture. So it shows that God is truly behind that, uh, behind what we're doing and what we're seeing. Uh, that being said, I also wanted to say, uh, Edward, you know, me and you were talking about this, where uh, we noticed within the community of fulfillment, there's a lot of difference, right? There's differences as we all kind of come in with our own baggage and we come in with our own strengths, and, you know, the good, the tools, let's say that that would be the opposite, right? You have your, your backpack with tools and you have baggage and, uh, you know, we come in with both and we have these different, you know, ideas and so forth. And I think what you're saying, Lynn, is, is beautiful. And it reflects exactly what I had said to Edward earlier that I listen to people to agree. I don't make it my business to listen with an intent to disagree. What I end up, obviously there's times where if you say something that doesn't sound right to me, I'm going to disagree. But my, my intent is usually to listen to agree so that way we can find what is the, the, the main message that we're saying, you know, and I think that's what's needed in the fulfilled community. We have a couple different on roads. We have a couple different backpacks with tools and we have a couple different, uh, you know, areas of baggage, you know, if we're going to be fair and honest there. So, uh, Edward, would you think that's a good assessment? I think it's an excellent assessment. OK, so, you know, and, and that I think that's important because what it does is it kind of calls all of us to relax, you know, to say, you know, uh, let's let's get together and, and think about these things. Matter of fact, you know, uh, shameless plug, I guess I would call this. Uh, I'm speaking at a conference this coming uh, weekend, and the goal is to rethink the resurrection. And uh, what I've been told prior to this conference is know that there's going to be people there that disagree with you, that, you know, that this is not getting together to pat each other on the back and say, you, you know, good job. This is saying, how can we come together with different ideas and then leave the conference, hopefully saying, well, this is what you know, spoke true. This is what rung true. And these are the other details that we need to, again, appreciating uh, Dr. Hiles's humility here, uh, that there's areas where I'm still kind of in transition. I'm still studying through and, uh, and so forth. So I appreciate that. And I think that it, it highlights the power of what we're doing, that we're, we're giving each other grace, we're, we're encouraging each other to grow. And, you know, thanks be to God that we're not trying to be know-it-alls, because I don't know anybody that likes a know-it-all. So, uh, you know, so I wanted to appreciate that. And 
Uh, one thing I did want to make sure I asked you, and Edward, I want to encourage you if you have any questions to, uh, you know, in regards to the ministry, we'll get into some more deeper stuff here in a moment. Uh, however, uh, one thing I did want to ask you, Lynn, was what is the name of your ministry? It's my ministry is simply Lynn Howes Ministries, uh, and there, my website is lynnhowesministries.com, and all of my itinerary and uh, books are there, all of my uh, audio, everything. We have a whole host of stuff there, as well as on our YouTube channel. My TV program is called Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. That's the name of it, hmm. Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And so that's, that's the name of our ministry. Might have good, nice quote there, that you might have life. Perfectly, that's what we're all endeavoring yeah. to do, amen. Yeah. Um, Edward, uh, but you know what I wanted to do, I know me and Edward had some questions in regards to some theology that we were listening to you talk on uh, some of John Noe's series, uh, obviously, the uh, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that was the Victorious Eschatology Conference, correct? Right, yeah, oh. that was the one I did in Birmingham, Alabama uh, in October of last year. Okay. And that was, that was open to not just leaders, but people in general. Amen. And, and of course, uh, what I'm going to be doing is sharing your resources, because as I mentioned to you off the air, we're, ho we're hoping to kind of pull together all these resources, provide announcements, let people know about different conferences, TV shows that they can watch. Uh, I know we have two charismatic preachers now that are on TV. We have Dr. Cindy Coates with Present Truth Matters. And now we have Dr. Lynn Hiles with That You Might Have Life. Look at that. Uh, some good encouraging messages for folks. Um, Edward, did you have anything you wanted to ask in regards to ministry or his testimony before I kind of lead us in on maybe talking through some of the details that were mentioned in uh, John Noe's series there, uh, Greater Than We Believe? Well, I had I had went through, I believe it's number 165, uh, series 10, I believe. And I just had some good points that he had mentioned uh, and maybe three points that maybe I mis un misunderstood. I I'm not too sure. But okay. uh, I, I love how he said, you know, in First Thessalonians 4, how the people were, how the persecution and being killed occurring in, in being killed occurring in the first century, you know, that church, uh, the church. And um, Paul speaking to the first century church. I thought that was excellent, you know, because I like background, you know. And Amen. then um, when he was speaking of uh, uh, physical appearance in clouds in 70 AD, coming over, well, no, well, let me see, going a little further down. It's not about what, what, it's not about where I'm going to live, but where God is going to live. Right. Not where I'm going to live, but where God is going to live. And that was referring to the mansions in us. Mm -hmm. I thought that was wonderful. Uh, and, um, uh, do not go back to this. Uh, do not go back to this. Referring to the sacrifices, for example, the red heifer. You know, and uh, it's not about the rapture, but it's about the resurrection of the dead. That's you right. know, but what I think I may mis misunderstood you when uh, I think when you had mentioned about uh, uh, many comings of the Lord Jesus and. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, many comings of the Lord, and uh, the the first fruits, those coming out of the graves. I kind yeah. of wanted to elaborate a little bit on that, if possible. Yeah, Amen. Actually, Lynn, if if you you don't mind, uh, I know you had mentioned that. Uh, matter of fact, that stood out to me as well. Uh, one of the things you had said during the presentation was obviously you believe in fulfilled eschatology. You point. You talked a lot about AD seventy, the forty year transition. Uh, then you you mentioned he is still coming. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, maybe you could elaborate and help us understand what you mean yeah, by that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess probably my thought was that, you know, what uh, John Noe's book uh, where he talks about, um, I forget what the name of it is now, but he's talking about a synthesis. Mm -hmm. And he talks about, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see, let me just say this. I don't see his coming as an event. I do see him appearing in many different ways. Uh, in other words, I, I believe that the coming of the Lord that the Bible prophecy was talking about being fulfilled was the AD 70 event. And I think all of the, uh, you know, eschatological things that lead up to that are pointing to that. 
what I mean by that is when I say appearings is that I believe people have had, uh, you know, for instance, you know, Paul saw him on the road. Uh, he appeared to 500 brethren. He appeared in an upper room. He appeared. So if we're looking at first and second, there's many appearings where he has appeared. And I, you know, I had an experience myself when I was, like I said, when I was 16, where I had the Lord appear to me physically and just uh, say to me some things that were prophetic to me that I'm that I'm actually doing right now. And, uh, you know, I'm not, what, what I'm simply saying to people by that is that I believe Jesus could appear in many different ways. My problem with trying to put that as an event in the future or a literal coming of the Lord in the future, and once again, I don't fight with people because, I, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of like, uh, uh, I, but my problem is I just don't have anything to hang that on. My problem with that is, if he does come physically and literally again, like we're like everybody's kind of thinking, where's he going to live? So if he lives in the Middle East, you know, if he lives in the Middle East, then, you know, uh, I got to go there to see. Uh, but, you know, uh, right now, you know, I talk about, that, you know, for instance, uh, you know, when, when we're in service, uh, even in that victorious eschatology, I said, you know, uh, the Jesus that's in this room is appearing in many different ways. He appears in his people. He appears in a cloud of glory. I've had experiences where I literally saw like a smoke of glory. You know, in other words, what I'm simply saying is he's God and, and he can do what he wants to do. But I think as an event, I don't see that as being an, as an event somewhere in the future. I think all those eschatological things. But I do believe he is a present reality right now. And, uh, and you know, I, I've heard people, reports of people who are having visitations of him you know, of Jesus literally appearing to people in the Middle East among Arabs, there's a great revival that's taken place among them. And it's because Jesus simply appears to them. In other words, I don't think he's a puff of smoke or a figment of my imagination. I believe if he could walk through a wall in an upper room, he could walk through a wall in service if he wanted to. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I think if like, for instance, I just believe that, uh, you know, there are many manifestations of him. I hope that kind of answers that a little bit, you know, yeah, so, you know, I'll say for me, one thing I'm familiar with the view I've, you know, I've, I've had moments of appreciation for John Noe's thought, and then I've had moments of frustration uh, yeah. with John Noe's thought, you know, and uh, kind of went back and forth. Uh, I've, you know, I've done debates with him on Facebook, and then I've defended him on Facebook. So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of been back and forth in that regard. Uh, I actually, if I may share this, uh, years ago, when I first began to understand what a preterist was, I actually went on a mission trip to Israel. And sure enough, I'm there in Israel, a part of the Christian peacemaker teams. And I'm telling some of my friends, you know, my eschatology, talking about theology, things I was, you know, my, my mission team there. And obviously everybody was looking at me as, you know, this is the weird guy that believes Jesus uh, already came. That's, that's strange. And uh, most of the people there were Mennonites that I was actually doing my uh, mission work with. So uh, then uh, our team leader shows up, who's a missionary there in Israel. And he says, I just want to get this out of the way for everybody. I want to let you all know that I'm not waiting for Jesus because I believe he's already come. And I sat there and I was like, I had to go all the way across the planet to meet somebody that believes this like me. And sure enough, I went up to him to make a long story short. And I said, so you're a full preterist. And he looked at me strange. And he said, by the way, he was from Germany. And uh, he, he looked at me strange and he said, no, I'm a Quaker. I said, a what? He said, a Quaker. And I said, well, you believe Jesus came back? You're not a preterist? He said, well, the Quakers believe in realized eschatology. He said, we believe that the Lord comes to us in our salvation. So what, uh, you know, a moment of salvation. So what I've learned listening to John Noe and understanding maybe the way that I see it as this, you know, destruction of Jerusalem and kind of focused more on that is I do see, to borrow a word, synthesis. I see what we're trying to say uh, that, you know, uh, when Christ came into my heart as a believer, that's a coming, is it not? And, and I understand that. So I'm hoping, you know, in, in the future, uh, there will be more conversation between, uh, by the way, I'm on John Noe's comments right now in his YouTube page, uh, kind of just trying to create some conversation around the distinction that there are those that just call themselves full preterists that do believe in ongoing relevancy, believe in kingdom work. And, you know, I, I probably have a little bit of a struggle with that word idealist uh, because I, you know, some of the baggage that comes with it just as yep. much as millennialist. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, that's where, I might not be in 100% agreement with the way John Noe frames it, but I think we're saying the same thing as rego in yeah. regard to the good news. Yeah. It's yeah. like I said, too, you know, I, I think that I didn't even know what preterist meant when I first started preaching some of this stuff because I just literally preached it out of Revelation. 
Hmm. So, you know, uh, the term idealist, like you said, that, you know, uh, somebody else said, well, you're an idealist too, because I, you know, I think one of the problems with, uh, like, if you, if you, if we get so strong in, in, in uh, which we should be as far as uh, the fulfilled theology, what that does is lead people saying, okay, well, then what's happening now? You know, in other words, is there not, you know, to me, what happened to me was I started to realize, well, then we must really need to realize Jesus is presently reigning. Jesus is presently doing some things in the earth right now. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm a part of that. And so I think that you can uh, get to the point where you're so arguing about what happened that you don't know uh, equipping people for where we're at and what I believe we need to be focused on, you know. And so that's kind of, you know, I don't even know if you call me an idealist. I always thought the, the view that I had of Revelation was kind of, uh, 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 you know, maybe I, I thought like a spiritual view because there's some things that I could say, you know, are imagery there that I draw from the Old Testament, you know, of, uh, of, of things that can show a spiritual reality as well as a fulfilled reality, you know. Yeah, because when I see too, you know, with the uh, year 70 is that it's distinct from all the other periods, like all the other times that Jesus had appeared, all the other times that there was, was, was war, because in the scripture, when it talks about the war, like the Jewish war or the second coming, you know, it fits in the year 70. Yeah. So that distinguishes, you know, that time period from any other period. You know, yep. not to say that things are not going on, you know, like, for instance, uh, God is tabernacling with us. So he's within us, you know, we're to continue Jesus' work. Jesus is the cornerstone, that foundation that the church is being built upon. So that's us, you know, the church being built upon Jesus Christ. And we're to, uh, with an uh, answer to the healing of the nations, you know, like when people say uh, uh, things are going to hell in a handbasket or, things in, uh, so bad, you know, it's up to us to try and fix it, you know, the individuals, you know, to do their part, because if everyone does their part, you know, we can, you know, we can accomplish a great deal, because it does say, you know, uh, the fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much, you yep. know, so a lot of times, not, it's not only prayer, but, you know, it's action behind the prayer, you know, believing that the prayer is answered, and, and, and you got a yes, so you act like, you know, it's done and you've taken the measures, mm -hmm. you know, to do was the healing process. You know. you know, matter of fact, John Noe's most recent video is called Revelation Reality. And what he's basically saying is exactly what we're highlighting here, that we're living in. And, and he actually highlights Dr. Lynn's teaching there uh, that we're living in this reality of post AD 70, you know, where. We're, we're living in the kingdom. There was something that was accomplished in AD 70. Not, you know, that may be the problem. A lot of times I think we're saying something ended and then everybody's like, well, if something ended, then what started, you know, and then no, we're not really answering that. If we say something was accomplished, what we're helping people understand it was the beginning of something. It was, you know, it was accomplished so that we might walk in it. And, uh, you know, so again, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, the, the discussion in that regard. And I hope we'll see more of that. You know, I might, I might say this, just this morning, I got called a futurist by somebody that erroneously believes in fulfillment. You, you know, they have a strange aberrant view. Many of us are probably familiar with it. No reason to give it any, uh, you know, mention here. But there's these different variations of people that, you know, you wonder. So are you an atheist just trying to get your own version of the Bible? You, you know, what, what's going on here? You know, please stay away. Um, you, you know, so uh, and what I appreciate about Dr. Lynn's ministry here is the working of the spirit of God. I believe that's so important. I believe that, you know, once we lose that, then we begin to lose focus of what actually is happening and what has been accomplished for us. Uh, you know, one more question. I know Edward, this is kind of piggybacking on what you had said there uh, about the, uh, the first fruits. Uh, you know, Dr. Lynn, I know that there's a little bit of difference in the preterist community, if you will, uh, in regards to what we're saying about the resurrection. And for me, sometimes it's a frustration because I, I think one out of every three preterists is saying something different about the resurrection that we're saying is accomplished. So it becomes like, oh gosh. So I know Edward had mentioned something about the first fruits. I was curious to hear your response to that. Uh, you know, what would you qualify as the first fruits and how would you explain that conversation? I believe we're leaning in on First Thessalonians 4 there and yep. uh, talking about the first, or actually First Corinthians 15 for that matter. Right. Uh, I, you know, I, my, my thoughts on that are, again, I haven't read a whole lot of other, this is just 
from my, my own personal study. So, you know, like I said, I'm a work in progress, but I believe that when Jesus rose from the dead in Matthew 27, when he got up from the dead, that was seen in the city. Many came out of the tombs then. There's no question that was a resurrection. And the fulfillment that would be would be of the wave of sheath of first fruit. And of course, you know, Paul uses the uh, harvest paradigm, you know, talking about resurrection. So that would be, to me, Matthew 27 would be Christ and the first fruits. Afterward, those that are Christ at his parousia or his perusia, which I believe happened in AD 70. And the reason I believe that is that, you know, uh, the first Thessalonians four thing to me is him dealing with that church, first of all, Thessalonica and the chapters before that and the chapters after that are relevant to that first century church. And he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who are falling asleep. So the whole subject matter there is resurrection, not rapture. And so what is what, what was really a shift for me was that I started to realize under the old covenant, when you died, you know, they said the Bible said they gathered their feet up in the bed and they slept with their fathers. But Paul's uh, Paul's message there is we're not all going to sleep. In other words, up until the covenant with death was broken and disannulled. Uh, and and the, to me, the final nail in the coffin was the destruction of the temple and the whole removing of the whole uh, covenant of death of uh, the, the mosaic system and the removal of the temple was when all of that was moved off the scene that that was uh, that was, uh, again, the parousia when when he, the Lord himself would ascend from heaven with a shout uh, and that the voice and he would come in the last trumpet. I see the last trumpet as sounding in Revelation, the 11th chapter, right after the 42 month siege by the Romans that sets it squarely. And, and AD 70 with, uh, you know, you see right after that the trumpet sounds and there's a resurrection that takes place there. Also, when you put the Daniel chapter seven and the Daniel chapter 12 in the same context of, if you read it in the Amplified Bible, it puts it uh, in the timing of the Romans being in power and even understanding that when Jesus stood before Caiaphas and he said to him, tell us plainly, are you the, the, the son of God or not? He said, he quotes Daniel 7. Most people don't know he quotes quote Daniel 7. He said that from henceforth, you will see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He's quote, calling himself the son of man because Daniel is one of the only books calls him the son of man. And he calls himself son of man all the way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that's why Caiaphas rent his clothes is because he, but when you read that in Daniel 7, not only did he appear before the ancient of days, but thrones were set, the books were open there was a judgment that took place to me that's the fulfillment of his promise to the 12 apostles that you'll set on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel and of course then that to me shows you know from from the time of the first fruits until you see the parousia in ad 70 there's a 40-year gap and that 40 years is an exact parallel to the wilderness journey uh, under the old covenant and everything that happened to them under Moses was only an example for us, Corinthians says, upon whom the ends, plural, of the ages, plural, have come. It was the back end of the old covenant age and the front end of the new covenant age. And there's a 40 year transition period there. And I just, I've been doing a lot of teaching on that recently because it, there's an Exodus paradigm all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, it's like, but he's talking about this time not coming out of a physical bondage. He's talking about coming out of the bondage of old covenant Judaism. And I hang that on Revelation 11 also when he said their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Our Lord was not crucified in Sodom or Egypt. He was crucified in Jerusalem. But the Holy Spirit is calling that old covenant Judaism Egypt. So the bondage he's trying to lead them out of is he's trying to lead them. So when John says there's the Lamb of God, he's announcing, hey, we're about to have another exodus. I wrote a book called From Law to Grace, a Kingdom Paradigm Shift, and I show how even in uh, that, uh, that when he, John the Baptist is introducing the lamb and they are at the location, I believe that they crossed over when they went into Jericho because when Moses died, he was replaced by Joshua, which is the Hebrew name Yeshua, Jesus. And so Moses can bring you out, but only Jesus can bring you in. And there's a lot yeah. I can say that uh -huh. in the book that I wrote, Law to Grace, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Moses brought you out with a rod, Joshua brings you in with a mercy seat. And uh, they, in Joshua, he said, here's the strategy. When you see a priest carry an ark in the river, you're going to know it's time to cross over. Well, John the Baptist was a Levitical son of Zechariah. He's a Levitical priest, and he's about to carry the ark, Jesus, into the River Jordan at the same location that they crossed, I believe, into Jericho. And the reason I believe that is because Joshua told them, 
He said, when you go down to the river, they're going to take 12 stones out of the river and you're going to lay them up on the heap on the other side of this river because one day you're going to, your children are going to ask you, what does this pile of rocks mean? What does this memorial mean? And you're going to tell them when you see a priest carry the ark, it's time to cross over. But John the Baptist is standing there in the middle of the Jordan River. He looks up over the bank of the Jordan River and he sees that pile of rocks. And he says, God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And everything about that should have screamed, it's time to cross over. And you see Jesus fulfilling every one of those. He was, he said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must I be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men into me, you know. So he's showing again that Exodus paradigm. You see him uh, even at when he, I wrote a book called The Great, I'm not trying to make plugs for my books, but I wrote a book called mm -hmm. The Great I Am. And in one of the chapters I talk about uh, where he says, I am the true bread. If you look at it, John 5, he leaves the feast of Passover. He crosses the Sea of Tiberias and there's a multitude in the wilderness. And the disciples come to Jesus and said, hey, uh, these people are hungry. We need to send them away. They can buy food. Jesus said, you feed them because he himself knew he, what he would do. The reason he knew what he would do is because this is not the first time he's ever fed a multitude in the wilderness after a Passover crossing the sea. This whole picture was a repeat of the whole Exodus journey. He just left the Passover. They crossed the Sea of Tiberias. They're in the wilderness and he feeds the multitude. And it's there that he says this. He said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they are dead, but I am the true bread that came down from heaven. And so he's showing them that was a type. I'm the fulfillment. You see him the night before his decease. He said, with great desire, have I desired to eat this Passover because he's inaugurating a new exodus. You see in Revelation 3, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I'll come in and sup. That's the cover that meal. That's the, he's, he's inaugurating. He's telling us it's time to come out of this Egypt and into the promised land and uh, you know all through that there's this exodus paradigm so you know I've, I've jumped ahead even talking about all of this stuff with resurrection but to me it puts it squarely on you know uh, it puts that resurrection uh in first corinthians 15 even right in the middle of that uh that seventh trumpet that sounds it's i, I recently was looking at you know because somebody challenged me about well what are you going to do with where it says you know and he's delivered up the kingdom to God. Then come at the end when he's delivered up the kingdom to God and God is all in all. And that one stumped me for a little while, but I began to realize that what he was talking about there is he had done the work of Messiah to natural Israel. He delivered up the, the theocratic nation to God where now God is all in all. In other words, he is not just a God of the Jew, but he's God to both Jew and Gentile so that they, his, his fulfillment of what he was supposed to do with natural Israel had given them another 40 years to come out of. Now God is both God of the Jew and of the Gentile. And again, that, that, that resurrection takes place there, 1 Corinthians 15, during the last trumpet, and the last trumpet sounds in Revelation 11, right after the 42 must siege of the Gentiles of the Holy City. That puts it squarely there. And then when I saw in Josephus' writing that there was the appearance uh, of, of, of the face of a man in the cloud and chariots and horses moving about and a voice from under the altar saying, we are departing hence, it was the souls under the altar. So that what he, Paul's telling these believers in 1 Thessalonians Chapter four is from this moment on, we don't sleep. That really helped me because if you ever go to a funeral they, they, and they preach a funeral, they got, they said, well, mom went home to be with the Lord. Well, I'm good with that. You know, that's comforting. But then the next thing you know, they're saying, well, and that great getting up moment when mom gets, you know, when the Lord, mom's going to get up. And then we're out the graveyard. It's ashes to ashes to dust to dust. And I'm like, well, what have you done with mom? Is mom with the Lord or not with mom, the Lord, you know? And so it gets confusing. But what, if what we do is we mix old covenant concepts about resurrection because under the old covenant, they slept with their fathers. They were waiting on something. But what Paul is saying is from this moment on, we will not all sleep, but we will be changed. And the, the word there where he said, we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The Greek word for air there means to breathe or to respire or to exhale. And it could literally be translated the moment you take your last breath, you're no longer waiting on the Lord. You step from this realm into the great cloud of witnesses and there's a welcome meeting with the lord at that moment and if you've ever been with anybody that's dying they'll start to talk to people from the other side my mother when she transitioned about two years ago she started talking to my father she started talking to my grandmother and she was not confused and she said uh, your dad wants me to go with him and climb go climb up on a rock i said do you want to go if you want to go it's up to you she said i think i'm thinking about it and later that day, she said, go get me a pencil, piece of paper. I want to write down a few things I want to take because I think I'm going to go with your dad. And she went home to be with the Lord. But I know my mom is not waiting on some great getting up moment. I know that that, that moment for believers post AD 70, we do not sleep. 
were changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And that happened for all believers in AD 70. Death was abolished. I mean, the scripture said, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And so, you know, I, I think that and there's so much I could say about that because I think the gospel is both objective and subjective. So I think there's ongoing uh, realizations of what we have been delivered, to, what has been delivered to us in full in that finished work. And we have yet to fully realize everything that is ours. I hope that makes sense. So that's that's how I see it anyway. Because I don't deny anything you said. I think everything you said was I, I agree with the last part about, you know, the the. the uh, the dying person, uh, you know, seeing uh, Christ, that's, I guess it's possible. I, I don't know. I, I haven't had that experience, so I don't know anyone, I, you know, because I'm really alone most of the time, which is yeah. sad, you know. But anyway, I agree with everything. But when you, when you have mentioned uh, the first fruit of the people that had died and got the, 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 the graves opening, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm equating like when um, Elijah woke the the, 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 the widow woman's son, he raised him from the dead. Jesus raised the centurion's uh, daughter. Lazarus was raised. Um, and I'm equating that with the bodies that had somewhat come out of the grave because they all had like died again. But I was thinking that, you know, um, in, uh, when those that believed in Christ and died in Christ, I consider those to sleep to whereas um, when, once Jesus ascended, because Jesus was, has to be the first to ascend. That no one can ascend before him. So yep. he's the first fruit of the first fruits that died in him, that believed yep. in him. You know, those were the ones that tran transitioned, you know, to come back with him, you know, during the, uh, the judgment and the rewarding. Um, and I guess that's, that's the point where, you know, the vindication of the martyrs, and all of that had occurred, you know, but I, I think, you know, as far as the first fruit, I would thought, I thought the first fruit was those that died in Christ, that believed in him, you know, prior to, you know, you know, as he walked and they had known him, you know, I thought those were the first fruits that died in him, you know, but the ones that came out of the grave, I thought I kind of equated those with the other ones that were risen just to show that Jesus said that I am the resurrection. And proving that, that statement is when those people came up and others saw them, they have to, they have to admit Jesus is the resurrection. You know, that's how I see it. I, I don't know, you know, if, if I phrased it, you know. You did. Yeah. If I may piggyback off of that and maybe offer, you know, again, I guess our theme word tonight is going to be, or at least mine is going to be synthesis, um, you know, to offer a sort of synthesis here. Uh, recently, I reviewed a debate that I did back in 2016, and the topic of resurrection was a big part of it, and I was debating a futurist preacher, and um, one of the things he brought up was Matthew 26, 27, and he said that uh, this was the, you know, what he, I guess, qualified with the first resurrection, and uh, as a demonstration of what all people would become at some later time in the yet future, and he argued that, you know, that that was a a part of the resurrection picture. Now, I agree with Edward uh, that it's a that it was a, a miraculous sign, not necessarily highlighting the resurrection of the dead. Uh, however, to synthesize it, what I did realize is that when you get to the Book of Revelation, these saints that had been, you, you know, the old covenant saints, if you will, are under the altar. So I do think that there maybe is some sort of transitioning. Maybe it's just the declaration of hope for the old covenant saints that's happening at that moment of Matthew twenty-seven. And then the final resurrection of the dead, obviously happening in AD 70, that they're getting their full declaration. You know, we say transition. So quite possibly the transition was not just on earth, but the transition is also in regards to the dead ones in their heavenly reality. That there's that minute of, you know, the proclamation that we talk about in the book of Peter or the epistle of Peter, that, you know, he uh, totally took the captives captive. Uh, so if you see that, that's the declaration that, you know, Satan is bound, victory is on its way. AD 70 consummates it, the dead are now raised, and as we're highlighting here, let's highlight our moment of agreement, that what we're saying after AD 70 is that there's no more middle transition, no more where is mom, where is grandma, where is everybody, uh, because I do believe that while we make a lot of jokes about funeral theology, there's some serious implications to what we're saying and the confusion that we're allowing to run rampant. So while there's even some disagreement in our own way of expressing it, I hope that we're making clear 
the hope of the reality of the hope that there's no more you know confusion that we know that when you you pass on from this life that you you move into that reality with Christ that you go into that that state of you know un, what we what is unknown to us that what I like to say uh, you read in the book of Romans where it talks about no mind can comprehend and you know the, the the love of God and I believe that's what I think we need to make clear as a reality of hope so I do think again. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I'm going to be speaking at a conference this coming weekend in regards to the resurrection. There's so that's just like eschatology. There's so many different inroads to the conversation that I think uh, we that that could take another couple hours. So uh, that being said, you know I hope that we we highlighted that. Uh, and Edward, I really appreciate you highlighting that and bringing that conversation up. As uh, I think that maybe we've we've dealt with some things. Lynn, what do you think? Do, do you appreciate the way that I, I package that? What Edward was saying. I want to give you a moment to share your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, the, like you said, I think the conclusion is the same, regardless, you know, of the, whether we agree on the two. I didn't really see any uh, opposition, at least to what I was saying with that either. Uh, but I, I think the clear thing is, is that, like, like you said, from here on out, what he's saying is that the moment you take your last breath, this corruptible puts on incorruption, this mortal puts on immortality. And uh, I mean, you know, for, for the believer, it is, uh, you know, it's it's not a waiting period anymore. That's what Paul was saying in First Thessalonians. We're not going to sleep. We're changed. And so I think that's the whole deal of what he was saying to them. Now, up till that point, and even that 40 year transition, there were people that were dying in Christ. And Paul said, listen, don't worry. They're not going to be left out, you know. So, hey, amen. Are you familiar with Ward Finley, uh, uh, Lynn? Well, I'm sorry. Are you familiar with Ward Finley? With who? Ward Finley. No, no, I'm not. Uh -uh. Okay, because he talks about, okay, when, when you have Christ within you, you have the righteousness of Christ. So we're made perfect in him, not yeah. of ourselves, but in him, in Christ yeah. Jesus. Yeah. So therefore, you know, like you said, when, when, when we shed this, we transition right into that, you know, yeah. but I just wanted to say that, you know, we are perfect through Christ Jesus, not in and of ourselves. That's right. right. That's right. You know, on the, in the vein of this conversation, uh, Dr. Lynn, if you don't mind, uh, after my presentation this coming weekend, I'd like to send it your way and hear your uh, thoughts. Uh, hopefully you'll give it a listen and I'll make it yep. concise and, uh, and hopefully clarifying uh, that you might see maybe where we're, we're saying the same thing and maybe even some areas where we're not. So uh, I'd encourage you to uh, view that. If you don't mind, I know we're, we're close to the end of the program here. I wanted to... Uh, we actually are past the end of the program, but I did want to unmute some mics just to let people maybe ask a question or give a comment. Uh, for, and of course, thanking them for their, taking their time out to be here this evening. And uh, if your mic is unmuted, you want to jump in and say something, please go ahead. Richard, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, surprise, I'm unmuted. <laughs> oh, brother, how are I, haven't, you? I haven't been saying much lately. Hello, uh, Dr. Lynn. I've never, uh, I've just become introduced to you today, actually. I had to look you up on Facebook and a little Google search to find out who you were, and I'll be looking up your resources. Uh, our lives have followed uh, a remarkably similar pattern um, in many ways. And I can remember when I was, uh, I, I was raised in the post uh, rapture, the post millennial rapture people. You know, I think I'm saying that right. Um, and uh, it, it just never made sense to me after a thousand years of peace and prosperity and health and healing and, and you know, where everybody would get up and say, we're sick of this. <laughs> you know, we're going to rebel against all of this peace and prosperity. And, and I, it just something about that just never gelled in me. And I had problems with it. And the other thing that always stood out in my mind was that scripture in, a, uh, I think it's Acts 15, when it mentions the tabernacle of David. And I was always baffled by that. I said, what do they mean? You know, what did, it, it just didn't seem like the answer that I would have expected from them, you know, given my, my uh, so-called eschatology at that time. But anyhow, uh, I think Dr. Lynn walked off. <laughs> I wanted to ask him a question, but uh, I think he disappeared. So um, no, I'm, here. I'm, back... I'm, still, I'm still here. I just had to step away. <laughs> while the camera went on. I was, I was wondering if you were Googling me and maybe that's why you walked off. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm still here. Um, yeah, the question I had for you is, you mentioned early, uh, and you can answer this privately if you want, you mentioned that there's still areas where you're unsettled, and I, I'm assuming yeah. you're referring to doctrinal positions. Yeah. I would be very curious as to what they are. 
Uh, well, I, my, some of my questions are, are have to relate to the millennium and the, the, the 20th chapter of Revelation. I still school still out for me in some of those areas. And when I did some of my uh, leadership uh, uh, gatherings, what I've done is I say, OK, here's what I kind of see. And then uh, I had others there that disagree. I said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to have a panel and we're going to present the different ideas and you decide. Uh, I, I'm a part of this thing, uh, or I haven't had any conversation with it for a while, but I'm a part of this thing called ACE. It's an Apostolic Council on Eschatology. It's a worldwide global think tank. I've never met these guys in person, but I've had conversations with them, and I can see there's varying opinions on the millennium. And I know, you know, that certain full prets believe that the 40-year transition period was the, the millennium. And uh, those are just areas that I still have some questions about, I guess. And then... Uh, uh, I still have a few questions about uh, some things that might relate to the wicked dead. So that 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 would be some of the the places where I'd still have a few questions. So, you know, what helped me with the millennium what uh, Don K. Preston said about basics. Yeah. Uh, when, when, when you know that the 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 end of the millennium, uh, the burning up the ele of the elements and uh, of the second coming and the raising of the dead. And, all of these things are to happen at the end of the age. If the end of the age happened, all of those things had to have happened. Yeah, yeah. And then you take it from there and then you like, you know, pick it apart. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I've, listened to, I've listened to his points on it and uh, then I've listened to uh, alternative views of it. And I was, like I said, I'm still not settled on that. And <laughs> I think the conclusions are still the same because I, you know, I, I don't see the thousand years as being, in, you know, if you do see it as an ongoing thing, it's kind of like a, not a literal number, but the ongoing, you know, uh, unfolding. Of this yeah. You know, where we can find agreement in that regard is, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever watched A Night of Eschatology with John Piper. Uh, they had a group of uh, different people sharing their view, the post-millennial, the amillennial, and the pre-millennial. And obviously we could all find agreement where, okay, those guys are. Uh, again, there were some good points. It was Sam Storm, Doug Paget, and uh, probably pronouncing his name wrong. Uh, however, uh, there was a couple, I uh, forget who the other preacher was, uh, that, you know, they, they came together and they shared, they had conversation. That being said, the reason why I bring that up is maybe we need to have a night of eschatology in the preterist community bring together some of these uh, different ideas on the millennium and and talk about them and, 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 you know, hear different views and be open to that. That's something we might foster here uh, through the preterist power hour, maybe have a week devoted to the millennium and welcome different guests and conversations in that regard. So, amen. Amen. Uh, Richard, did you have any more questions you wanted to ask? Uh, no, no, that was, that was uh, the question. Um, you know, there's, I don't, I, I don't have a problem with the thousand years as much as I used to, uh, because I took that as literal, you know, and it's just amazing how we have this habit of reading Revelation. We say, oh, that's symbolic, that's symbolic, that's symbolic. But as soon as that thousand years comes up, that can't be symbolic, you know? Um, and that's the way most of us will read it. But uh, when I got into preterism, it just settled and, knit to, and knitted together the Bible in such a way that had never happened before. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I said, oh, here, these pieces of fun, all these, these, pieces of a puzzle I had, you know, a little understanding here, a little understanding there, all of a sudden they all started to line up. And, and it was just an amazing, uh, an amazing thing. And actually yeah. the person who got me started on this journey actually was Carlton Pearson. For those of you that know who Carlton Pearson is, who yeah. I consider a friend, uh, because yeah. when he made his theological shift uh, away from hellfire and brimstone, um, I, did a study on hell and, and became, you know, also convinced that it wasn't the torture chamber that I was always uh, taught to believe it, that, you know, that it was. And it was the first time that I said, my God, if I can be wrong about something this huge, what else am I wrong about? You know, yeah. <laughs> what else don't I, don't I understand? And that became the, the quest uh, where, okay, I want to find out now. It's not, not where I'm right. That's where, how I used to study you know, get a book on what I, what agrees with me. And that justifies my view. You know, I started to study views that I didn't agree with. And one of them was preterism, which I dismissed. I laughed the first time I heard about it. You know, I just said, oh, please. You know, <laughs> and I just laughed it off. It just seemed so absurd to me. But yeah. once I started to uh, 
understand the scripture, scriptural backing for it. My God, I mean, it's like, it's just amazing, you know. So I, I'm, I'm still in awe of what preterism does, and I believe, like you, Doctor Lynn, that we are in a time right now where here we are again at Armageddon and Matt Gog and May Gog, and now the world needs to hear an alternative. Yeah. You know? And and I really believe this. We are in a season. Something's going to break. Amen. Because like you said, there's yeah. enough information out there now. There's books everywhere. There's there's yeah. people, you know, a lot of people preaching this now. And I believe that a lot of futurist preachers, and believe me, I know many, and I've worked with many, they're scared because this is going to kill their ministries in many respects. It actually will revive them, but mm -hmm. they don't see that as a revival. Yeah. You right. know, it, it's but it, it, it they they see it as a loss of income because there's money in this futurist stuff. Yeah. I mean, you want to you want to you want to go broke, go from futurist to preterist. You'll be broke in a very short period of time. You know, uh, uh, it, because it, it just eliminates a lot of the manipulation that you know. I don't want to get into that here, but yeah. I really appreciated your comments, Doctor Lynn. And I I, I did yeah. want to say, Mike, I haven't been saying much lately. Uh, because I got two things going on sometimes, but I really appreciated the study on Esther. Um, because those were like two, the Gog and Magog thing never plugged in to me, you know. And and Esther, well, wonderful story, you know, but that was about it. And I remember when I did read it, the thing that impressed me the most was that she went in to see that king, you know. It's like this woman had some cojones, you know. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but she really had. In that, in that day and age, I mean, my God, that yeah. was really something. Uh, but uh, I, I really appreciate that study and I appreciate what you're doing, Ed. Same to you and everybody Thank else you. that participates in this. We're all we're all reaching somebody. That's and right. A lot of times we don't even know who we're reaching. Yep. We'll probably be one of the last ones to know. But huh. I really I'm I'm going to keep going forward. Mike, Dr. Lynn, Ed, you know, all Zach. Whoever, I can't see, that's as far as my little screen goes. But uh, I really think it's time for a reformation. And I think it may start with one of these big time, multi-million dollar futurist preachers comes out and says, I was wrong. Hmm. And it'll just send a tidal wave. You know, of course, yep. it'll be briefly well, I could, ostracized. I could, I could tell you there's some that are. And uh, I, I, I know they're in the wings. I won't mention names because uh -huh. I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to put it on uh, Facebook, I guess, but I can just tell you right now, there's a major shift going on among some really key leaders. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say this as well, you know, and I, I'm going to have to go before too long, but uh, it really is important what we believe because it affects world politics. It affects what we do in the Middle East. It affects what we do. You know, I, I'm, again, I'm not saying this to try to drop names or anything, but I was invited to Washington in the middle of the Iraqi war to have dinner with President Bush. And uh, he told me that uh, he, he, he asked me to sign a book, one of my books on Revelation to him. And I signed a book to him and several other politicians. And he said, these other preachers are crying. The sky's falling, but this guy's got some answers. And he said, Washington's out of answers. And so, uh, you know, they're looking for somebody that's got some answers that, uh, you know, that this is not Armageddon. This is not the end. And uh, I mean, that's a guy with his finger on the red buttons. I don't know if I had any influence or not on that, but I did get a message from him that he read my book three times. And, and so I do believe what we believe is important. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> I noticed we have a uh, Vicky unmuted. Vicky, I wanted to give you a moment to just jump in quickly if you had something you wanted to ask or make a comment. No, I oh, I, I came, I came to learn about uh, for Phil eschatology about ten ten to fifteen years ago, and uh, I was so blessed. And everything is like gold mine. Amen. <laughs> and the riches of Christ. Amen. Well, thank you for being here tonight, Vicki. And uh, okay. I thank all of you, of course, for being here. Uh, Lynn, uh, I thank you, of course, very much for your, your time, your wisdom, your ministry. I want to encourage everyone to visit lynnhilesministries.com. Uh, we'll go ahead if you visit. Oh, it's our simple. lynnhiles.com. Just lynnhiles.com. L-Y-N-N-H-I-L-E-F. How do you spell your last name, Hive? How do you I believe spell it? 
H I L E S. That's right. It. H I L E S. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to provide a blog. Uh, if you go to powerofpreterism.com, you visit our blog. We'll have a blog with uh, all of the resources. I'll be doing some digging, sharing some links and resources from Dr. Lynn Hiles, as well as a, the link to his ministry website and also this podcast. So uh, we encourage you to visit powerofpreterism.com, like us on Facebook, visit our YouTube page, subscribe. We have a host of different ways that you could be a part of our uh, conversation here. Again, I'm very uh, grateful for our night, a testimony Tuesday, uh, indeed. And uh, if I may just share one last thought in closing, uh, or two last thoughts in closing, the first thing I do have to make mention of, of course, is our upcoming announcements. Uh, We have the conference, uh, 2022 Spring Conference, Uh, happening March 26th through the 27th in Rogersville, Tennessee. That's Holston PBU Church. We'll be rethinking the resurrection. Here you could obviously see the the agenda for the conference. There's been some changes and then some edits. Uh, The conference is going to begin Saturday night at 5 p.m. There'll be a host of speakers, myself, Scott Laughlin, and Brees Maggard, and then there will be a Q&A. And then, of course, Sunday will continue. There will be Alvin Dixon, Jonathan Buttry, and uh, a review a sort of round table, if you will, uh, happening there at the conference. All of this will be made available to you through the Power of Preterism uh, Facebook page. We'll make sure all of it is uh, shared and that way you could be a part of it, even if you cannot be there in person. Uh, one other announcement, of course, we've been talking about. Uh, there's a resurrection debate happening on April 2nd between Stephen Whitsett and uh, Steve Baisden, uh, both who are looking for their first win, to borrow a joke from a friend. Um, they, uh, uh, again, they're both going to be joined by Sam Frost and Holger Neubauer. It is not at LifeGate Church. This is a, a graphic that needs to be updated. However, it is still happening in Fremont, Nebraska. So we encourage you to uh, be a part of that. We'll be sharing those resources. And then lastly, uh, in April, April 23rd through the 24th, I have the privilege of being there with Ward Fenley, who Edward had mentioned before, uh, we'll be at Prospect Baptist Church in Sullivan, Alabama, and we'll be preaching there about uh, the doctrines of grace and, of course, fulfilled eschatology and the power of kingdom mindedness. We encourage you to uh, be a part of that. Uh, There will be uh, streaming online. I'll be making available through our ministry, and uh, I hope that you might be blessed and edified by those resources. Uh, One quick thought for a testimony Tuesday. Here at the Blue Point Bible Church, we're studying through church history. And we find ourselves in the period of 110 to 150. And we're reading one of the earliest, what some scholars consider to be the earliest apologetic writing in the Christian history, the Epistle of Diognetus. And sure enough, if you read that writing, I just wanted you to hear this this morsel of truth that comes out of that writing that should bless us, those of us that have come to understand, let's say, a Revelation 22 reality in our lives. When you have read and carefully listened to these things, you shall know what God bestows on such as rightly love him, being made as you are a paradise of delight, presenting in yourselves a tree bearing all kinds of produce and flourishing well, being adorned with various fruits. May each of us have the fruits of the spirit emanating from us and may we be rejoicing in them, living in them and blessing others with them as well. Uh, That's our testimony Tuesday. Lynn, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you uh, to conclude our our session in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for our time together and for the ability to be able to learn and ask questions and to grow and to be about like-minded people and to be able to share ideas without any contention. We thank you for that opportunity in the fellowship of the spirit and the bond of peace. We pray for these guys as they continue to minister in the different streams that they are in that will reach people and their hearts and minds will be opened in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all for being here tonight. Go in peace and God bless. God bless. Thank you.